My name is Keith Bozeman, and I'm currently with uh, Blue Venture Investors, which is uh, an early stage uh, cybersecurity uh, venture capital firm. Keith, thanks so much for making time to join us on the Ivy Podcast. I'm excited about today's conversation. We've been planning this for quite some time. Glad we're finally able to make it. Uh, before we dive in and talk about all the great things you're currently building, uh, give us a uh, thumbnail version of your career to date, and I would love to spend some time talking about you, just overall your background. Sure. Uh, career to date right now, um, I'm currently doing some uh, early stage venture capital uh, investing and in, uh, based out of D.C., although I moved to Florida last year. Uh, we primarily do cybersecurity. Um, we started out doing just product technology, and we've kind of evolved. I've been doing this about seven years, ever since I left Tech Systems, an IT staffing firm, uh, for seven years. And we pretty much evolved, evolved into more of a uh, cyber investment um, firm uh, with some other uh, technology stuff. Before that, I was with Tech Systems my whole career, uh, 25 years. I was president for the last 12 years. Uh, Tech Systems is uh, the largest IT staffing and services company um, in America. So uh, first job out of college and just kind of moved up the ranks with uh, Tech Systems. That's super cool. And thanks for sharing that. I, I definitely want to double click on both of these experiences as, as you know, the, the person in charge of growing the, the staffing organization and then progressing into the venture capital side. That's an interesting transition. Uh, but before we do that, Maybe share a little bit more about you, just from the personal story, your your backgrounds, where where do you come from, and maybe some of your early days. Sure, sure. Um, well, I come from all over. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest mainly, but I moved around a lot. So I was raised by a single mom. Uh, I never knew my father, so we would just move. Um, I uh, you know went to school, kindergarten, first grade in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, from there, we moved to West Virginia, back to Ohio. We moved to Texas, back to Ohio, to Indiana, to Texas, to California, back to Ohio. And then we ended up in Indiana. I ended up going to high school in Indiana. So we would move a lot. Um, middle of the school year, I mean, I counted up once. I think I went to 18 different schools growing up. And I know a lot of people look at it and they, they don't believe it. They think I'm exaggerating. I thought it was 20, but I, I, I can count 18 because some I forget because it'd be third grade. But most years, uh, I wouldn't start and finish the school year in the same place. And wow. my mom was in one of those situations where she's a single mom. I was the oldest of three, two younger brothers and problems would start happening. And her solution was, let's just move. So we'd move. And, uh, and so like in Texas, I went to two or three different schools, California, I went to three different schools. Um, and there'd be times we lived with families. So we would not even have our own place. We would just go move with one of my mom's friends and live with the family for three months or six months and, and then move. Uh, but Ohio was really always the home base. So I kind of considered um, Dayton like where I grew up. And then my sophomore year, I was going to go to high school. I think in Dayton, they had like seven, eight, nine was middle school or junior high school. But we moved to Indiana, Shelbyville, Indiana, small town in uh, Indiana. And that was where my mom was from and moved there, went to high school there. And when I moved to Shelbyville, I was like, man, this is the nicest place in America. I mean, this place is great. And uh, it's like a factory town, 20,000 uh, people, one high school, 1,000 kids in high school. but it was kind of suburbia um, and it was, it was nice to me back then. I kind of look back and laugh now, but so moved to Shelbyville and uh, had family there. Uh, I started working with my uncle, did drywall. I'd always do drywall in the summer and during like the spring breaks and Christmas breaks. My friends are going on spring breaks, but I was going to finish drywall. And then right before my senior year, I think this is like July, maybe August, my mom's like, hey, we're moving to Virginia. And at this stage as a senior, I'm not even thinking about, all I'm thinking about is, well, football season's getting ready to start and we're supposed to have a party in two weeks, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm not moving this time. And she's like, what? I go, I'm just going to move. It was Uncle Ed. That's what I worked for. I go, and I would stay out there all summer with him. He lived like 30 minutes away. I would stay all summer. So I, I lived with him in the summer and like during the holidays. So I just said, I'm just going to 
live with Uncle Ed and you guys can move to Virginia because I'm not moving anymore. So and it wasn't acrimonious. It was just one of those things. And uh, so uh, my brothers, my mom moved to, we were living with a boyfriend at the time. They got in big fights. So that's usually when the move starts. And so they moved to Virginia. I moved out with my uncle and just drove back and forth to high school, um, finished high school. And during high school, I was a good student. I was an okay athlete, uh, but I wasn't even, no one in my family had ever went to college. And my uncle thought college was kind of dumb to go to because he'd seen some guys go, go to college, quit and come back and, and they were doing drywall. So he was thinking, you're just gonna do drywall anyway. You shouldn't even go to college. And he wasn't doing it to like hold me down. He just really believed that college was a waste of time and money. Uh, so I was going to go on the Coast Guard. And I wanted to be a fireman. And, and you couldn't get a job as a fireman like right out of high school. So I was going to go to the Coast Guard and then come back, become a my best friend in high school. His dad was a fireman, be a fireman, finish drywall my days off and, you know, have a good life. But middle of my senior year, one of my coaches was also my teacher, one of my football coaches. And I remember, I can still just picture it, you know, we're outside of class, class is over, we're staying outside of class. He's like, so what are you going to do? And I go through this whole thing, Coast Guard, fireman, drywall. And he's like, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you go to college and you can be a teacher, you can teach business ed like I do, uh, and you can be a football coach. And that was the first time I seriously considered college. And I, I don't know if it was January of my senior year, but it was after football season my senior year. So it was late in the year. And I'm like, yeah, maybe I will. He goes, you know, I'll drive you up to, to Ball State. He goes, I know some coaches up outside of Ball State. I know some people at Ball State. So he's the one who drove me up on my college visit. Um, so we drove up. And the visit wasn't this formal take a tour. There was a visit of uh, drove me around campus. We got out, walked around the quad or whatever. And then he took me out to this small high school where he knew the football coach. And I interviewed with him uh, for a volunteer job. So I tell people I got the volunteer job. But um, so uh, ended up getting that job with that, that high school uh, football team. Uh, I had not taken the SAT at this stage. So I had, I had to take an SAT. And I remember I took it. I had to go to a different town. And it was mainly all juniors. But it was the last day a senior could take it for uh, – for college of, of that year. So anyway, take the SAT, get into Ball State, uh, coaching football. And uh, I remember I went up there and it was like, I was in, I had a Chevy Chevette at the time. I, I can't even compare that to any car now, but I had like a box and two trash bags and I moved myself in. And I remember I got there real early and I'm thinking, all right, everybody's gonna be there. But I get there and my roommate didn't get there till the afternoon. I remember just sitting there, I had no TV, no refrigerator, no anything. I just had my clothes. Um, so I moved myself in. He he got there. His, of course, he has his mom, dad, his grandma, grandpa. I they have groceries. They have a refrigerator. They have a TV. They, you know, they have the whole setup. And I knew him from high school, so we were friends. So it worked out great. But um, so anyway, end up a ball state, and I really thrived at ball state. One, just like when I went to Shelbyville, I'm like, this is the nicest place in America. When I went to Ball State, I'm like, this has to be the nicest campus in America. I mean, if I had ran into someone from Stanford and they would have said, hey, Palo Alto is prettier than Muncie, Indiana, I'd say there's no way it can be prettier than this place because look at this place. So uh, go to Ball State um, and thrive. But at first, it was kind of bumpy because my mom had moved to Virginia. So... <laughs> I was considered out of state. I didn't know that. I didn't know anything. I didn't know any, any how to do anything. So I go to use my mule card, reject it. Um, I go to the financial aid office. They're like, well, you, ha you have to pay out of state tuition. So you have no extra money for meals. You don't have enough money to cover your meals. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to like go through this whole thing. It took like three months to get this, uh, get considered in state. Uh, the other thing is I didn't have books. Like when I went to Ball State, I think I went there with like 25 bucks. I mean, I didn't go there with any money. And I thought it was going to be like high school. You go to your class, they hand out the books. And, you know, so the first six weeks, I had no books. I'd go to the library and see if they had an old version of whatever the syllabus said to get. So no book, books the first six weeks. Uh, coaching football, uh, volunteering, driving out to the to small high school. Uh, I remember my grandma gave me a check for $100 once she heard that I didn't. Um, 
have any books. So got books, and I did fine. Um, uh, met friends, um, rough academic first, uh, first semester and second semester was okay, but then started doing good grades wise, met a lot of friends and just really thrived. And a lot of it was, I remember looking around thinking like, like the, the, the kid in Shelbyville would think, oh, all these kids are going to be sharper than him or smarter than him. But I'm looking around at these kids. I'm like, yeah, I'm as sharp as this guy, you know, and, and a lot of them, like I'm sharper than a lot of these folks. So I gained confidence that way. Uh, so anyway, great times through uh, Ball State and uh, graduate. Uh, I was on the five-year plan. Um, and, you know, there weren't a lot of people. This was in 1993 I graduated. And back then, no one knew there was a recession because there's no CNBC. I wasn't reading anything, but we're, it, that was like a mild recession. So nobody on campus. So I got... Uh, I got an interview with this company, ADP. My old coach knew a guy who was there, good sales organization. I knew I wanted to go into sales. I, I, I was going to be a teacher. I got out of the teaching track. So I'm like, I'm coaching. I coached high school football for four years. I'm like, I don't want my career to depend on these 16 to 17 year olds. So I knew what it was like to, 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 to um, deal with them. I, I loved it. And I still love the fact that I did it. But anyway, so I go into the sales route. And I remember I'm going down to... Uh, I'm going down to Indianapolis. One of my fraternity brothers had graduated a year earlier. I'm going down to visit him. And we're at this bar. It's in Broad Ripple, which is kind of like the bar area of Indianapolis. And one of his friends is there. And he's talking about this company, Aerotech. And I'm like, all right. And he goes, he goes they're growing a lot. You got to work 60, 70 hours a week. Uh, but they're, they're expanding everywhere. And my wife now, we've been married 26 years. We dated in college. And I told her, I just said, hey, when I get out of school, I'm going to move anywhere in America. I'm going to work. I said hundred hours a week and I'm going to work hundred hours a week because I just want to make sure I'm somewhere in five years. I, I grew up so poor. I, I just, the whole, my, I was obsessed with never being poor again. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm at this bar. It was like one 30 in the morning. I remember cause this band's playing and he's telling me about this company and I'm like, man, this sounds great. So I call him the next day and he kind of blows me off. I call him the next week. Oh, Hey, what about this company? Aerotech? Anyway, he knew his brother-in-law worked there. So he uh, got me connected with him, interviewed with Aerotech uh, and ended up getting the job. And just as I'm going through the interview, everything they were saying was exactly what I was telling my then girlfriend, my now wife, was what I wanted. Sacrifice, hard work, a lot of opportunity, offices all over, opening places. And it was just one of those things where it just aligned. Um, so that's how I ended up at Aerotech. And uh, started there in 1993. Mm -hmm. First job in uh, Fort Lauderdale. So when we're going through the interview process, I wanted to go to North Carolina. So in the early 90s, Carolina was like Nashville now. It was kind of a hot market, growing market. And I wanted to go to Charlotte or Raleigh. And the phone interview with someone in Raleigh. And they said, well, we don't really need anyone. She goes, well, there's a place. We need someone in Fort Lauderdale. And I'm thinking... I did not want to start my career in Fort Lauderdale. All I thought of Fort Lauderdale was like 80s movies about spring break. I'm like, I go, what about Charlotte? And then I'm like, what about Atlanta? And we kept going back and forth. And finally, she's like, all right, there's Dearborn, Michigan or Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I go, Fort Lauderdale sounds great. So anyway, ended up in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, so just like I got to Ball State and really thrived, when I got to uh, Aerotech at the time, I really thrived. I mean, like, like I said in the interview, it just matched up with what I wanted. It was hard. I mean, we worked eight to eight. We really worked 7.30 in the morning until eight at night. And mm -hmm. we very rarely ever left before eight at night. But, but, that, but that's what I wanted. Um, and I was good at it. And like anything, when you're good at something, you're gonna enjoy it more. Uh, so I was good at the job. Um, I aligned with the culture. Uh, again, the culture, the job was staffing, but the culture was competing. Um, once you got promoted, you always had one or two people working under you. It was teaching them. It was preparing them to be promoted. It was helping them be successful, which I love doing from my uh, coaching days. So, so I was like coaching at a company, but I was able to make money like a salesperson versus make money like a teacher. So anyway, really thrived. 
and that was when the company was starting to explode. It had not exploded yet, but at the time, I remember the year before, we were like 150 million in uh, sales. Then my first full year, the company did 300 million in sales. And I think five years later, we were a billion in sales. Um, so I think 98, 99 hit a billion, mm -hmm. then 2 billion, then 5 billion. Um, so anyway, did great. I was recruiter, promoted into sales. Uh, a year into sales, I promoted to run the office. Um, I ran the Lauderdale office. Uh, and then I went from Lauderdale. Uh, they asked me to move to Michigan. So my wife and I moved to Michigan. I ran uh, the office up there, the uh, Warren office, called on General Motors. Mm -hmm. And then a year after that, I was promoted to be a DRO, which was, we didn't have any VPs. Steve Bishotti, the founder, and Jim Davis wanted to keep it a flat organization. So I ran a region, Midwest region. Um, and then... A year after that, I was promoted to be VP of uh, the automotive division. So I was vice president. So I, I think I was vice president by at age 26. So my career was like this, nice. right? And it was just, it, it, and it, it didn't look like it was going to stop. So I run the, the automotive division. Year in, uh, things are going good. But, but it, it, was, it was kind of a turnaround situation year in. Then I start, you know, feeling some pressure and it wasn't pressure from above. It was more just, you know, I was just putting this pressure on myself. And then I started thinking, what if this happens? What if GM lets go of a thousand people? What if this, what if that? And I started losing sleep. And uh, then it just kind of compounded itself. And at the time I was 26, I was probably 27 at the time. You know, you're, you're you don't want to tell anyone. Like I didn't even want my, my, my uh, wife, we had, my wife and I got married in 1996. Uh -huh. So I didn't even want to tell her that I was losing sleep, but she was the only one new. I didn't tell my best friends. I didn't tell anyone I work with. Certainly didn't tell my bosses. So I started losing the sleep. Then I got to a point like five days a week, I would only sleep one to three hours a night. And, wow. and I don't know if you've ever done that, but it really started like piling on. And, uh, and I was just, I, I gained weight. I was pale. I just was not good in, in a, a good mental state, still working hard. The, the division was doing great. I remember we went to this meeting and uh, we're at this meeting. We're in this circle. There's like 10 of us. And uh, I, forget, I don't even know what the question was asked. And somehow it comes to me and I'm like, you know, I start crying. Like, like, like you know, sometimes when you squeeze in, the tears still come. Uh -huh. I just break down bawling, like puffing and puffing, bawling. I'm like, I feel all this pressure. I feel like I'm all alone in Michigan. No one's out there. And, and everybody, and I was kind of the rising star. I was the youngest one in that circle and everybody's just looking going, what the heck is going on? And then I'm scared to death. It's, it's the president of the company at the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, he's going to take me out of the job. There's no way I'm staying in this job. Mm -hmm. um, so I go through that and it, it was amazing because what he did was he, they didn't take me out of the job. They supported me mm -hmm. and they, they helped me through that time. Uh -huh. um so anyway that ta that takes a while to kind of get through once you get yourself in that mental state it takes a while to get yourself out of that mental state so it took me a while but again career doing great um division doing great and in 96 97 that's when aerotech split out into four operating companies mm -hmm. so it was aerotech was always kind of like what we call scientific engineering then we, we split out to networking let's call it network pc deployment that was tech systems Applications was uh, Maxim, and then we had environmental and light industrial was on site. So they split out. I was still in Aerotech. The automotive division was part of that that engineering division. And then in nine into ninety eight, they asked me to move over to Tech Systems. So we were Tech Systems and RVP in ninety eight. Um, and my first child uh, in Michigan. We and then, then we moved to uh, Maryland. Moved out there. Um, going good. And that was in the, in the nineties tech, uh, allegiance, allegiance group, all the, the whole company was growing like crazy and the economy was going like crazy. That, that was leading up to the dot com. So, uh -huh. um, Johnny look a little young. You probably weren't around in the, working in the dot com, uh, bubble, but I was leading up to the dot com bubble. So it kind of reminds me of now, as far as the economy growing, 
and not enough people, like we were just promoting people left and right, just, just putting them in, in different roles because we were growing so much we had to. So, we, you know, I got promoted early before I was ready and grew into it. And we were expecting the same. And when you're doing that, it's tough. You just have a lot of people who aren't ready and a lot of people who won't grow into it. So mm -hmm. uh, go through, uh, get promoted in 98. I'm in tech, going well, trying to learn. My career is still going like this. Even though, I, even though I hit that adversity, it was tough. I mean, it was like it, mentally it was tough. Um, it, it, was, it was hard. Uh, how do, can I can I ask um, yeah. how do how did you deal with that because it's a it's a sensitive topic and it's very rarely talked about but I, I definitely appreciate you opening up about it but in terms of things that really helped you overcome that um, because during that time you were so focused on your career you're just starting out the family seems that way and what are some of the things that really helped you kind of just just get yourself out of that so one. I did what you shouldn't do, which is just kept it all inside mm -hmm. and, and didn't talk to anyone. Um, what really helped, two things that really helped. One is I had two mentors. John Kerry was the president of the company. Excuse me, Mike Slander was the executive VP. They really wrapped their arms around me. Mike Slander really wrapped his arms around me to, to, to help me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like as a leader, I always say you got to push and pull. Most of the time we're pushing people, like yes. pushing them to do better, pushing them to work harder, pushing them to achieve their goals, pushing them to each reach their potential. But sometimes you get people who get so wound up and get all this pressure on them, you got to pull them back. That's the pull. Pull them back from that pressure. Pull them back from those expectations. That's what Mike slammed. I didn't need pushed. I was pushing myself to the absolute limit. I need to pull back. And that's what Mike Slander did for me. He pulled, he pulled back. The second is we had this industrial psychologist um that we had hired a couple years before and he would do these feedback sessions with you and things like that i don't know if you've watched billions but like that that, yeah, that yeah, woman yeah, on yeah. Billions, i forget her favorite name. show yeah like axe was like steve bashotti and that woman was like the, like our our person who did that yeah, industrial yeah. psychologist not the manipulative part but the, but the positive part he really helped me like shift the paradigms like i thought i had a sleep disorder i'm like i just got a sleep disorder he goes well, tell me about it. I go, well, Monday through Friday, I can't sleep. But, or Friday and Saturday, I can sleep. Sunday through Thursday, I can't sleep. But that's not a sleep disorder. Mm. But it was so bad. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm just going to quit. Because when you're in such tough times, you, don't look, you look inside, but you're like, I got to get rid of what's causing me this pain. And, and, and what was causing me this pain was Aerotech, my job. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'll go back and be a professor. I'll go, I'll go get an HR job where there's no pressure um i'll be a football coach i mean i was really i mean i didn't interview anywhere but i was thinking that because when it's like 3 30 in the morning and you can't go back to sleep and you're laying in bed all those thoughts go through your head but anyway i had great mentors and leaders they pulled me back um helped me through it this industrial psychologist helped me like just change paradigms about stress and about the pressure uh and, and then you just gotta you just kind of got to get through it too but you need people around you for sure. I have a great wife at the time. I mean, she still supports me, but she's always supported me, but uh, it, it, it's certainly not easy. Yeah. And, I, and I tell people, no matter what happens in your career, I mean, I'm telling you this career path, people would have were, were like, Oh my gosh, you're going to have adversity. And it's, it's going to come in different ways. Um, probably when you least expect it, but everybody's going to go through adversity, no matter what they look like on the outside. Right, right, absolutely. No, definitely, definitely. Thanks for sharing that. That's very interesting. We could probably spend the rest of the podcast talking, you know, specifically yeah. about this because it's such a, it's such a interesting space, at least for me. And it's uh, there's not a lot of coverage on that. So I definitely appreciate you sharing some of that. So you going through this insane career growth, that trajectory going up, uh, with going through the ranks within the organization, and you've mentioned that you guys have been hiring a lot, promoting also very fast. Uh, but on the other side of the spectrum, when it comes to retaining the top talent, I would imagine that also was another layer of complexity. Can you share a little bit more, some more insight on some of the strategies that maybe really helped you retain the top talent, at least the folks that you were hiring, that you were promoting, uh, and just keep them motivated, but at the same time, not pushing too hard uh, so that it leads to some type of, uh, you know, stress. So just want to hear some of your feedback from that perspective. 
Yeah. So, you know, this is my philosophy. It's not everyone's philosophy. And again, in the staffing and services world, it's all people. Right? Yeah. It, 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 it's, there, there's nothing but people. You, right. need, you need an accountant to make sure the bills are paid and the invoices go out. You need someone to make sure the computers are working. But your product is people. Your, your customers are people. Your employees are, it's, it's just an all people business. So, so me, one, it's about building a relationship and a connection with the people, right? Mm -hmm. So if I, if I want to, if, if I have a team, I want to know who the team is, uh, in order to get to know them, they got to get to know me. So I, so I got to start with, I want you to know who I am and I want to know who you are. And there's a few reasons for that. One is, um, I want to try to build a connection. Right. I want to see if there's a connection and build, build that relationship Two, I want to know what's important to you um, in your career. And more importantly, what's important to you, what are your personal goals and you your personal goals, and your professional goals, but I want to know what your personal goals are. And I always try to use their career as a vehicle to achieve their personal goals. So the professional goals, who cares what they are? Cause it's all going to go back to, I, I want to pay off a wedding. I want for me, I wanted to pay off my student loans. I had a bunch of student loans. I wanted to pay them off in four years. Well, Aerotech was my vehicle to do that. That was more important to me than getting to being a VP. What was most important is paying off those loans. So what are your personal goals? How can our company or how can this team help you achieve those personal goals? And then as I get to know you better, there's this paradigm some people have about, I don't want to get too close because I have a tough time pushing. My philosophy was the exact opposite. The closer I was to someone, the easier it was for me to push because one, I knew how to push. So for leadership, from a leadership perspective, that push-pull is critical, I believe. So what I wanted to try to do, build a relationship, build a connection, understand what made this person tick, whether it's goals or uh, internal motivation, teach them as well as I could how to be successful, push them to be successful. And, and I felt like you're not going to retain everybody, but if you can get someone where they say, all right, here's where I am. Here's where I want to go. Yeah. Here's the, what I want to achieve outside of the company. And this is the best company team situation to achieve that. They're probably going to stay not yeah. always, but they're probably going to stay. So that, that's kind of a, a long, a long winded answer. Uh, no, I love it. I love it. I, I absolutely love it. And, and I, you don't hear that often from a leadership perspective, because I've, you know, I've had my share of great leaders. I've had my share of really bad managers. And at the same time, just learning through those experiences and leading the teams myself, what it's within the same lines, what has really worked always is really the relationship aspect. And at the same time, focusing on what is it that I'm trying to achieve myself as a person. And then as a leader, if you're able to really find that path for, for, for someone to be able to connect your personal goals with those of the organization or the team and lay out a path for that, I think that's one of the key ingredients for success. And I think that makes a lot of sense what you're talking about from retention perspective. Yeah, it, 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 and you're taking uh, the, the, the person and their spouse out to dinner. Yeah. You want that spouse walking away saying one, your boss, this person's a great person. I, I think they're a good, high integrity, high character person. And two, if they're feeling like you're going to help them achieve their goals, because mm -hmm. when you're young in life, when you're starting out, like you got all kinds of, you know, where are my kids going to go to school? Am I going to have kids? Where am I going to live? Um, yeah. And, and if they feel that way, I think they're going to work harder, right? Oh, yeah. well, and the support them more. So that, that, was, that was my philosophy. And I, and I learned that from Steve Bishotti. That was his philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, who was the founder, original founder of our company. So, um, nice. you know, he, he passed that down to us, but that, that's something I tried to live by. I still do from a leadership perspective. Well, that makes perfect sense. Uh, and thank you for sharing that. Um, as far as, so you, you've been within the di different divisions of the organization and it seems like you've taken on the roles that you've been asked to and always succeeded in that. And developing a particular growth strategy is is not something that you know you see in the book and you put it together and you execute and you go get it done it's a lot of situational awareness as well and understanding all of the variables that come into that 
And I would imagine that even in your current role right now, as you choose the companies to invest in, and as you do invest and you help the companies develop that growth strategy, there's certain tactics that go into that space. Can you spend a couple of minutes talking a little bit about your thoughts on just developing and executing a growth strategy that's, you know, and maybe some of the lessons learned through some of those experiences that's, that you've, uh, you've, you've encountered? Like, like what I see currently or, or when I was president of tech or, or yeah I would love to start where you know in your during your time within uh, aerotech and, and tech okay. systems some of the things that really helped you there yeah so I am mean, one it's hard work and this is this is something I tell my kids I got three kids in college who are getting ready to start in careers it all starts with hard work then it starts with luck but the the, the people who work the hardest get the luckiest um so from a growth standpoint so when I took over tech it was, it was in the middle of the dot-com bubble bursting. So our revenue had dropped 50%. We went backwards 50%, but we had grown like crazy. Like, like one of the top whatever companies in America as far as growth. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to go from staffing to services, like outcome-based services. This is called outsourcing services. And we, we, believe it or not, I think in 1999, we built a data center to do web hosting in Portland, Oregon. So you got the staffing company who's doing, who's going to try to do web hosting in Oregon. There is no way we, you could go from staff. It, it like if staffing's here, the service offering of web hosting is like 20 levels above that. Um, failed miserably. We got into services. Our first application was a custom application, not an app like today's apps. This is like an application that was customer facing. Our very first out, uh, application build was customer facing. You don't do your very first application you've ever built customer facing where the customer's gonna get up, it's gonna screw up. And they were, we, we totally messed it up. We lost that account. So I'm gonna get, circle back to one way to grow. One, you gotta grow your internal, but we had a core of staffing, but we needed other services. So it's grow from your core. So layer service offerings that are close to the core. I read a great book, The Profit from the Core. And it was about, you know, what's your core business and then build services around that or product around that and then, and then layer it out. We, we had jumped to the other side. So um, I think one thing you have to be able to do if you're going to expand your, your business is have a strong core, which our core wasn't strong in the late 90s because everything was going gangbusters. We didn't have great people. So we had to get our core strong and then, and that was through people, through processes, through systems. And then we built service offerings off of that core and layered them, um, which really helped us grow. You know, I took over in 2003. So our growth rate from 2003 uh, to like 2008, nine, till, that, till the financial crisis was, was pretty darn good. And, and a lot of it was because of that, that philosophy. Right. Well, that's pretty interesting. And given the, the, you know, the, the, the market conditions during that time, I would imagine that's also was very cyclical uh, going, you know, through the, you know, the dot com bust and dealing with a lot of the recessions that, you know, you've mentioned, I would imagine took a lot of adjustments as well as you define the strategy and you get to execution and certain things do change and you have to adapt to that. So that's always very interesting to, uh, to, to, to talk about. Um, as far as, so you've spent most of your career in, in, in staffing, recruitment, talent acquisition space. And I would imagine even to this date, you utilize that experience, that expertise with the companies that you work with or your companies that you invest in. What are the different trends maybe that, that really excite you these days, maybe in talent acquisition and staffing? Or in general, you mentioned you also invest in cybersecurity pretty actively. Uh, what are you personally very excited about? What are you researching? What, what's... Uh, What's on your radar? Yeah, so uh, yeah, the thing I loved about transitioning to Blue Ventures was I had never seen a term sheet. So tech systems, we had acquired multiple small companies, but you know, we had a whole M and A team. You know, it, it would it would come to be who's we were going to acquire and meeting with executives and looking through stuff. But as far as like a, a term sheet, I had never really looked through a term sheet, not not closely. So transitioning to doing venture capital, it was a great, it was uh, stimulating. Um, and it, it, it was totally different 
technology, product technology is totally different than uh, service technology. Mm -hmm. So transition to the product side was great. Uh, it's much more technology driven, obviously. It's a lot of engineering driven, you know, staffing, you could kind of fake it and outwork the competition and find that person. If you don't have a good product, you're not gonna outwork the competition with a bad product. So it was different, but the thing that's very, very similar when we're making an investment and when I'm making an investment, the number one factor is the team is you still go back to the people. The product has to work. It has to solve a problem in the market. It has to have a, 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 a size in the market where it can scale. But if you don't have the right team, it's going to fail. So uh, it's very similar um, to staffing in that way, uh, mm -hmm. although the product's different. Right. Uh, the things I see, because I, I talk to my kids about this. So, so I have this different lens. One, I'm doing these investments. Two, I have this lens of my kids' career. So uh, cybersecurity is not going anywhere. Um, artificial intelligence is not going anywhere. Uh, data management is not going anywhere. Everything is data-driven. Uh, I'm just trying to tell you, uh, the, my, suggest the industries I'm talking to my kids about. Um, uh, battery technology. <laughs> isn't going anywhere with the with the uh, electric cars yeah. uh, and then some other stuff fintech medical tech uh mm -hmm. some of the other stuff but that, that's the stuff we're seeing now from a technology standpoint makes sense makes perfect sense definitely exciting trends and as you partner with these organizations that you invest in the startups or maybe established mm -hmm. companies i would imagine you know just like with everybody else the founders the executive teams of those companies surrounding themselves with the top talent is, you know, is the top of their minds 24-7, uh, whether they actively recruiting or not. And having you as a strategic partner, that advisor who spent most of the career in that space, you know, I'm sure adds a lot of value. Tell us a little bit, maybe give us an insight. What are the types of conversations you're having with them? What are the different advice that you provide to those founders when it comes to really attracting the top talent uh, to their teams? Yeah, I think um, one thing that's easy to overlook is uh, character. Um, and so you, you, kind of, you have skills and characteristics. So uh, your skills are maybe your programming language or your experience in a certain industry. Uh, and your traits are your work ethic, um, your, your character, your integrity, uh, your loyalty. And I think it's easy especially for technical people, not to stereotype, but technical people to look so hard at the technical aspect, at the mm -hmm. skills aspect of someone when they're, when they're assessing, is this person right for the team? So one thing I just try to stress is, hey, they have to, I don't understand the technical part, so I can't help them with the technical part of it. Uh, but, but what I would stress to them is, look at the, the traits part of this person. Mm -hmm. um, work ethic, um, integrity, uh ability to get along with the team team oriented uh so i think that's that's a critical element yeah that makes a lot of sense it's, it's probably it's probably the hardest element of you it know is. the whole evaluation because it's one thing to evaluate the technical skill set and expertise through some types of assessments but to be able to to understand engage that type of you know just the character alone i think it takes a lot of practice number one uh, through to be able to develop that muscle as you talk to as many candidates as possible. I think that's, uh, that's an interesting area. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, as far as your content diet these days, what do you, what do you consume on daily basis when it comes to just self-education for learning purposes? Share with us what's your, uh, what's your content diet looking like these days? Uh, I read a lot. Um, uh, I watch a lot of po podcasts. So, you know, one I've been uh, watching a lot lately is All In. Um, one, I don't watch, I don't watch any news. I mean, it, it, maybe the local news I'll, I'll watch, but I, I, like national news, I don't watch any national news. No, uh, <laughs> it's because it, because it just, it just messes with my head. Um, so I don't, I don't watch a lot. Uh, what I like about this All In is it's three, people who have been successful and they'll talk politics, they'll talk business, they'll talk economy. Uh, so it's good and, and they don't, everybody has a bias, but it's not this trying to get ratings here or trying to get ratings there. And 
you can yeah. tell some people are a little left leaning and some people are a little right leaning, but, but they kind of balance themselves out. So that, that's a, that's a good one from a business standpoint. I've really focused on my uh, nutrition and fitness a lot since I was able to work, uh, quit working and have a lot more time. So Peter Atia, he's a, a doctor who has a, a great podcast. Um, another doctor, uh, Rhonda Patrick has a great podcast. She's more of a scientist. He's more of a doctor. Yeah. Um, YPO, I'm a member of YPO, Young Presidents Organization, although I'm not young anymore. Um, so I, uh, I'm involved in that, uh, really looking into China. I'm a part of our China business network. Mm -hmm. um, just looking at China and what's going to be going on with China and, and their economy and the world economy over the next five years. I kind of like looking at like macroeconomic stuff. Obviously, I look at what's going on in the States, but I like looking at macroeconomic stuff. So those are some of the things I, I read. Wall Street Journal. I read Wall Street Journal every day. Um, That's super interesting. Yeah. I, uh, I love that all in myself, you know, for you do. <laughs> OK, so you, very you similar reasons. It. I've read uh, um, uh, Jason Calacanis's books. Uh, he's yeah. like a super angel, and it's fascinating, kind of how he came up from nothing and just became that super angel, most kind of famous uh, investor out there. And then Chamath with his ideas on like the SPACs and everything that's going on. Yeah, I love that's the right. dynamics of the the chemistry they have on the podcast. So that's a great recommendation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, yes. And Keith, last but not least, uh, you mentioned you read a lot, and you mentioned a book through through this conversation as well. What are, um, what are you currently reading, and is there a book that you always recommend to others, and uh, why is that? Oh shoot! Currently reading, uh, it's kind of like songs on my um, Spotify. I don't know the name of the songs. It's Peter Thiel's book, and it's about when he wrote. I think it's called One. Um, it's about startup. And, oh, is that uh, zero to one? Yes, zero to one. Yeah. 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 Zero to one. Yeah, I'm reading that right now. Have you, have you read that? Yes. Yeah, it's an amazing book. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like Thiel. Um, and so I'm reading that. Do I have a book I always recommend? Not necessarily. I've always liked biographies. Uh, so the, the Warren Buffett biographies, the Steve mm -hmm. Job biographies. Um, and, and I tell people, these folks are geniuses, but they're crazy as well I mean, yeah. no matter which one i read anyone who's accomplished extremely great things are extremely like right. crazy uh in certain respects I, I can't think of one that i always recommend but that, that's what yeah. i'm reading now zero to one no th that's a great book and those are great recommendations and one one uh book i recently read it's you may be interested in that from venture capital perspective is the secrets of the sand hill road uh, okay it's uh, Scott, Scott Cooper, a couple, I, I, I'm mispronouncing his last name, but I'll send you a link to that. That was a great read. It'd be great. As far as uh, kind of what are the different behind the scenes intricacies of actually like venture capital, because we're all thinking just people with money running around throwing checks at people. No. So it's a fascinating world. So I, I'm sure that uh, you deal with that on a daily basis. And what I would love to do is do kind of a second part of this podcast to talk more about your day-to-day on you know as a venture capitalist as an investor what are the different strategies that really you execute on a daily basis to select those unique founders whom you decide to back yeah um so i would definitely love to continue the dialogue and just keith overall can't thank you enough for your time today it was a uh, very um very enlightening and at the same time you opened up a lot about your background as well it was very interesting to hear so i i definitely appreciated that today yeah john thanks for uh, having me appreciate it enjoyed it